Okay, shall we have another word of prayer? You may be seated if you want, or you may stand, you can, whatever, um, and I will pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, I thank you again for another class and another opportunity to, to, uh, uh, yeah, to speak about prophecy. I pray for your spirit to keep being here and to keep speak to us, and that you may give us wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's take a look at how to interpret Bible prophecy. And uh, I guess, I don't know, you, have, you, you will have some classes with uh, Tiago about hermeneutics, correct? I think so. Oh, on Friday, okay. Uh, anyhow, but this is more specifically for prophecy. Um, and one of the main principles, I would say, of interpreting prophecy is found in 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 20 to 21 chapter uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 20 to 21 and it says knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation okay this is important it's not that i can privately interpret it as I think it fits. But what happens? It's in verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Okay, so how are we to interpret it? How are we to interpret prophecy according, according to this? Not by ourselves, or the Spirit, and the Scriptures that were written down, right? So the Bible interprets itself, right? That's a guiding principle. We need to find, we need to let the Bible speak, the Word of God speak. Okay, and First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, on the screen there you see it. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can we know, he know them, because they are, what? Spiritually discerned. Okay? So they have to be understood in a spiritual way. We need the Holy Spirit to get this understanding. One other text, Isaiah chapter 28, verse 10. Isaiah 28, verse 10. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Okay. What does this mean? We have to gather information. Good. Good. We have to, we have to look at different parts of the Bible, compare scripture with scripture, and see, okay... We'll get some more clues by doing this. So, but if I take out one Bible text and try to interpret it myself, I mean, that, that, that's when it becomes wrong. But we have to see it in the context. We have to compare it with Scripture again. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. This is what we have to do to get this understanding. Um, if I would ask you to write, or no, if... Let's say, if you would ask someone to write a book about yourself, who would you ask? A book about yourself. Who would you ask to write such a book? My mother. Your, who knows me very well. Okay, your mother. Someone who knows you very well. Right, that's what we all would do. I mean, because what, if... I wouldn't ask you to write a book about me because you don't know me so well. That would be an interesting book. I would like to read it. <laughs> but, you know, the Bible, do you know how many authors altogether? The authors. How many people have wrote? 44? Yeah, so, so at least, yeah, around 40. Is it 44? Is it? Okay, you're sure? Okay, 44. I don't know why I've written down 40, but I may be wrong. Anyhow, around 40 different authors of the wrote the Bible. Uh, and uh, so around 40 authors wrote 66 books. And then the, imagine, you know, you see 
they wrote this to reveal the plan of salvation. And you see like a red thread through the whole Bible. You see that they are actually agreeing with one another. There may be passages which seemingly look like they disagree. But, you know, if you look at in the context, you see that there is an agreement. And if you would ask 40 authors today to write a book, they would not even agree on the title. I mean, they would really have a hard time coming together, write about the same theme and have the same thoughts. But God, we read that God inspired men to speak. He, he, he sent the Holy Spirit to those who knew, who he knew would represent him or would write what he wanted them to. So, this is a key to understand the scripture. It is to compare scripture with scripture. Now we're going to take a look at some different views, different ways of interpreting the prophecies. Are you familiar with this? Preterism, Futurism, Historicism. How many of you have heard about this, uh, this, uh, these things? Some of you? Okay. Yeah. So, it uh, looks like we have lost... Oh, oh okay. Uh, so, you're still there. Okay. All right. So, we're going to start... Uh, Talk, briefly talk uh, about uh, preterism. Preterism, what does this mean? What, are, what is, this, what is the, the center of this view? Yeah, so you interpret the prophecies to be more in the past, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, highly emphasis on the past, and um, that means what? The prophecies are history. Almost all of them are history. That's that's according to this view. And uh, do you know who came up with this idea, this way of interpreting it? It's a hint here. It's a little bit hard to read, but uh, it was a, a, a Jesuit named, let's see so I get the name right, Luis de Alcazar. Luis de Alcazar. He, um, he wrote this during the Counter-Reformation. You know, in the 1500s you have... Martin Luther in 1521 put up the 95 Theses on the door to the Castle Church in Wittenberg. Then, uh, fifth, what did I say? Did I say it correct? Fifth, 1521. In 1545, this is when this guy, uh, Luis de Alca Alcazar, uh, came up with this, uh, this way of interpreting prophecy. Because what happened after the, the Reformation, or a, after the beginning of it, the Catholic Church came with a counter-reformation to counteract, to go against the Reformation. Because it was very dangerous for them. They would lose members. They would lose influence. And also it gave, went against how they looked upon scri the Scripture. So then this Jesuit came um, with this idea of... Uh, of the scripture, and by the way, the Jesuit order, do you know when it started, uh, was founded? 1534. 1534? Uh, I don't know where I, I, uh, yeah, it's not that important, but I, I saw the, the year 1540, I guess, I don't know if it's uh, very, very short, but anyhow, around this time. So, shortly after, they came with this way of interpreting uh, the scripture. Preterism. So, basically, putting Emphasis on the past. The prophecies are fulfilled. Most of them are fulfilled already in the past. And so later this will spread to, to uh, Protestantism. Started with the Catholic Church, then quite soon later, in, um, uh, I think, yeah, very, very soon after the 1640s, some Protestants starting to, started to accept it already. Only 100 years it took, and then the Protestants were accepting this. Okay, um, then we have futurism, quite obvious, uh, have, have, having emphasis on the future, putting most of the prophecies to the future. And again, a Jesuit came with this idea in the 1590s, Francisco Rivera, Francisco Rivera. So, um, in doing this, you know... The reformers, why, why do you think they would come with, with, uh, with these views, the Catholic Church? Why would they come with two different views so quickly? 
I already said, mentioned that he was a part of the counteract reformation of them to go against the reformation. But why specifically do you think they would do such a thing? Why would they come with different interpretations just suddenly like this? One reason I believe is because the reformers pointed to them, look, they are the Antichrist. Most reformers and Protestant churches used to believe this, that the Catholic Church is the Antichrist. And then it's pretty smart to come up with a view that puts the prophecies in the past or in the future. That means, you know, we cannot be the Antichrist because, look, they have already happened. And, and this, is, this is what they were doing. Look, here, here's a quote from uh, Jerry L. Walls from the, uh, the o Oxford Handbook of Eschatology. Eschatology means, um, you know, end time events, what will take place. Futurism argues that the revelation looks beyond the first century to the period immediately before the end times. Thus, the book was not written for those who received it, but for those living much later. Jesuit scholars, after the Reformation, refined this approach to prove that current attempts to identify the Pope as the Antichrist could not possibly be true since the Antichrist will not be revealed until far into the future, just before the parousia or Christ's coming. So, this looks to have been uh, played an important role in, in coming up with this idea. Um, so, what they, were, what they were doing was to kind of pushing in to a switch of focus, you know, get, get your focus somewhere else, don't focus on us as the Antichrist. So, you know, look here, this is how we should read the prophecies, preterism first and then futurism. So that changed, of course, the view on the Antichrist. You know, look, the Antichrist is uh, Nero in, in the 68 AD, or it's um, Antiochus Epiphanes uh, before Christ came. I mean, so, or he's going to come in the future with seven years of tribulation. They t take some, uh, one of these to take the last week of, Dan of the 70 weeks of Daniel, Daniel 9, right? And put it in the future. That's what m uh, many of the fut these futurists do. How? I don't understand how that would be logical, but that's what they do. And they say, say that Antichrist will come and reign for seven years in tribulation here on earth. Um, so, uh, these ideas came, why? To come with a switch of focus among the Protestants, to, to take away the focus from looking upon the Catholic Church as the apostle side and Antichrist. Okay. The last one, historicism. This should be, yeah, I think uh, at least all of you have heard this being used. And this is more balanced, in, in contrary to the other ones. It's putting the prophecies on a timeline. It's outlining the prophecies. It's also called a continuous historical event. Some are in the past, some have happened, some are going to happen, or some are, or, and some are happening now. So what we use right pretty obvious after what I've said, I guess, but uh, we believe as Adventists in this method, historicism, putting it on a timeline. Why is this correct? Well, huh? You see it in history, right? You see, you see that things really have happened, like the Bible said. Uh, it makes sense, I mean, um, some things have happened, some things have not happened. Here's a quote from Ellen White, Acts of the Apostles, page 584. In the revelation are portrayed the deep things of God. Its truths are addressed to those living in the last days of this earth's history, as well as to those living in the days of John. Some of, some of the scenes depicted in this prophecy are in the past, some are now taking place, some bring to the view the close of the great conflict between the powers of darkness and the prince of heaven, and some reveal the triumphs and joys of the redeemed in the earth made new. So, Ellen White must have clearly believed in this histori historistic view on a prophecy. Some are in the past, some are taking place now, some will take place. Okay, so <clears throat> if you take a look at Daniel, uh, it's not a chronological book. Uh, today we would write it 
you write some things in chronology usually. Uh, but that's not how the book of Daniel is written. Um, and we're going to get in more into this tomorrow. But um, we can divide prophecy into classical and apocalyptic prophecy. Classical prophecy will deal more with persons, people, uh, and the nation. The current time. Okay? Apocalyptic prophecy, also called an outline prophecy, is dealing more with, you know, uh, rise and fall of kingdoms. It's, it's pointing to the future. Uh, and it's usually a long, long span of time. And here you will find more symbolism used, contrary to the classical prophecy that deals with the, the time, uh, like a short time periods. And, and then here also, what, that we will discover soon, the day-year principle is applied to this one, the apocalyptic prophecy. So this is more sim symbolic. Uh, you see, for instance, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 11. They are talking about many of the same things, um, but it's like a, it's like a, it starts like a telescope. You see a wide picture, then all two, then it goes down more and more and more smaller towards a microscope. They're going into more details about certain important things, and. Um, You know, Daniel also has, Daniel has these two kind of prophecies. This is one, the apocalyptic ones in the chapters 2, 7, 8, and 11. But then you also have the classical prophecies. Uh, for instance, Daniel had a prophecy about King Nebuchadnezzar that he would lose his kingdom. Uh, and now I'm not referring to, he, he would get off the throne, basically, for seven years. That's more a classical prophecy. That was a literal seven literal years that he would um, disappear. Okay, so what we are doing here in, uh, in the Western world today, in, in Europe maybe in particular, uh, we have a little bit different mindset than what those who wrote the Bible and from that culture. Today, for instance, if I'm going to do some uh, scientific research, I will collect the data at first, and then I will come up uh, with a hip hypothesis, hypothesis, and then make a theory, and then I'll look at the results and the effects. But in the Bible, reading Bible prophecy, many times you will see that uh, the Bible is starting with a result and effect, and then comes uh, the explanation. Let's take one example in Micah chapter 1. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time here, but I'm just going to show you uh, a little bit uh, of this mentality. Micah chapter 1. And, and we can read verse 3 to 4. If someone has it, Micah chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. Okay. Yeah, Micah 1, 3 to 4 to start with, yeah. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him, and the valleys, the valleys will split like wax before the fire, like horses pulled down a steep place. Okay, is this an explanation or is it rather an effect? And the result. What do you say? He's saying he will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. That's more like an effect, isn't it? Like a result. This is what he's going to do. Okay. Uh, look at now verse five. It's a, yeah. It says, and all this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? So here you see, here comes the explanation. Rather, 
behind the result. What's behind the, the result and the effect? So first the effect, the result, and then you have the explanation. And if you go on, verse 6 goes back to the effect uh, again. Uh, so first the, the prophet will give the results. And then come, came the explanation. Uh, and you all can also see this a little bit in the book of Daniel. Um, and uh, chapter 10 in the book of Daniel, you have this, this is like an introduction uh, to uh, the last prophecy. We're not going to study this now, but I'm just mentioning. So chapter 10 is like an introduction. Then you have chapter 11 is the explanation of the prophecy, and chapter 12 is like a conclusion. Um, today, if, if we would put the, Dan- the book of Daniel together, rather than going from chapter 7, 8, and 9, we would probably choose chapter 9, and then chapter 8, and then chapter 7. Why? Because it would be in a chrono- chronological order of uh, events. Uh, so, this is, this is how we would do it today, but prophecy is not always chronological like that. Uh, chronologically explained, I have to say. Okay, so <clears throat> what about symbols versus something literal? <coughs> when, when do we know what is symbols? When do we know what is literal? Roughly. What do you say? Symbols are mostly explained. Mm-hmm. Symbols are explained. Um, we can say roughly that when the vision is given, when we read about the vision, it's mostly in a symbolic language. Not always. One exception would be Daniel when he gets to the judgment scene after the kingdoms. He says judgment took place, uh, thrones were seated, and so on. This is more literal because we know this from the rest of the Bible that it is an actual event taking place. So that's an exception. But mostly you will see that the vision is given in a symbolic language, and then the explanation is mostly also given in a literal language. So that's some guidelines to, uh, for us to know. Um, now we're going to take a look at, at one particular way, and maybe some of you are familiar with this. Have, have you heard about chiasms before? No one? One? Yes? Okay, so a few of you maybe. Uh, Chiasm uh, is a word it, based on, it comes from the, the letter uh, chi from uh, Greek. It looks like this. It looks like an X. And this will help you un- remember it, what it actually is, because it's revealing a little bit what it means. In the Bible, you will find sometimes the use of this. It's a type of parallelism to emphasize on something. You see, in the Bible, when the Bible was written, you don't find any dots. You don't find any bold or underline, right, in the original languages. They didn't use that. When they wanted to come with a point, they had to emphasize it in a different way. But we would, of course, use bold today or underline or, you know, dot and so on, exclamation marks. But the Bible uh, frequently uses chiasms. So what is this? You can look at this as a ladder like this. It comes with its unique repetition of patterns. For instance, you start here down uh, at the ladder with two different or two similar thoughts that are fitting together. And when I say that, I mean in the beginning of the verse, here comes a thought. And the same thought, or at least equal to it, you'll find it in the end, like on a passage. In the Bible, it can be a verse, it can be several verses. And then here, next step, you'll find an equal thought. The, the second from the beginning and the second from the end. And then you go like this toward the top. And in the middle, it's like a climax. This is uh, then what they want to say. If they do it, if it's written this way, you can be sure that in the middle, that's where we find the center that they really want to emphasize on. And it's not always that easy to understand exactly uh, what it is. And we, I think we need to do that with prayer also. But sometimes it's more obvious than others. So we're going to take a look at some examples. So basically it's a repetition of ideas in, the ver- in reverse order. 
and it's in particular in the Old Testament, it's, uh, it's uh, more common. So what benefits do we have? What benefits do we have from chiasms? I already told you that uh, then it shows an emphasis. Uh, but it will also be easier for us, for instance, to memorize something. And they did this a lot uh, in Bible times. They memorized big parts of the Word of God. So this, this is helping uh, greatly for this. Um, it's easy to remember it. Uh, and, well, basically then you will memorize it also. And uh, it will help then to explain a, a certain thought in a better way. And this is also, in a sense, uh, beautiful how God communicates something through this method. Okay, here is an example of a chiasm. In Matthew chapter 11, and this is known by all of you, I'm sure, verses 20 to 30. So let's see here. Uh, it says in the beginning, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And then what do we find in the end? My burden is light. Christ has come unto me, all you that have laden, and my burden is light. And in number, uh, number two, or B, in this, and I will give you rest, take my yoke upon you. And in the center, what we call X here, it says, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Then you have to be again, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy. Do you see how this is corresponding to the first B? It's talking about the same thing. With maybe a little bit other words, but it is the same. And then they, like I mentioned in the end there, my burden is light. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Can you see it? Maybe the, maybe the first time it can be a little bit uh, um, hard, but you see that there are similar thoughts here on the ladder, where X is on the top. So what's the center here? This one seems to be pretty obvious because there's only one thing there in the middle. Learn of me, for I am meek and lonely in heart. Look at me and learn. And when you see the, such uh, things like this, uh, you, can, you really discover, wow, this is really what Jesus wanted to communicate. Learn of me, for I am meek and low, lowly in heart. Okay. Uh, so it's also like a sandwich, if you want. Maybe you will understand it better. A, B, C, C. Sometimes there can be two, two parts in the middle. A, B, C, C, B, A. You have two bread, and then maybe you have, uh, let's say, tomatoes. So the A is the bread. The B are the tomatoes, and the C are two slices of tofu in the middle. Okay. <laughs> Uh, or you have A, two A's, the bread, and then you have two B's, two tomatoes, and then you have only one slice of tofu in the middle. That's how, that's how it works, and it can be either way, and different variations. Sometimes it's, it's, only, it's even shorter than this. But uh, let, let's try. Let, what about this one? Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. What is the chiasm here? Take a look at it and see if you can find No man can serve two masters, he's starting with, for either he will hate the one or love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Do you see some pattern here? It's maybe hard to put exactly what is what right there, but you see the pattern. And we can say, oh, wait, this is a chiasm. Let's take a look at it. So let's see. A, the bread. No man can save two masters. And in the end, what does it say? You cannot serve God and mammon. The same thought here. B, the tomato. For either he will hate the one, and then the second B here is, and despise the other. Same thought in a sense, different words, right? And in the middle, the double tofu. And love the other, or else it will hold to the one. Do you see that? Do you see it, this pattern? What can the center point be here? Well, it could be to love God. To love God. 
because it's talking about God here in Mammon, and here in the middle, love. You're holding to one. You cannot, you, you cannot serve two to masters. You have to choose one. Love God. That could be the center point. Do you get the idea? Or is it a little bit confusing? I think you at least get the idea, and, and it can be hard when you see it the first time, but the idea is that the Bible wants to emphasize on different things and show us, look, this is what I want to emphasize on here. Without using bold and punctuations and exclamation marks and so on. Um, but again, in the Western culture, we usually focus on the beginning and the end. And uh, by doing this, we may miss the point. Okay, so chasms in Daniel. Do we find chasms here? There's, a, there's, a, there's actually a big chasm in the whole book of Daniel, half the book of Daniel. Have you heard about this? And this I find interesting when I saw it. Uh, it's divided in, I can give you a clue, it's divided in chapters. Can anyone guess? If I, if I tell you chapter 2 to 7, what do we find in chapter 2? The dream. Rise and fall kingdoms, right? What do we see in, the, in chapter 7? Rise and fall of kingdoms, okay? And what about chapter 3? The, the friends in the fiery furnace, right? They were persecuted. Persecution of, uh, of an angry king. Persecution of a king. Let's say persecution of a king. And Daniel 6, is there persecution again of a king in a sense? Yes. Because, uh, remember there were some people that didn't like Daniel, to try to get rid of him and say, let's implement this law. And they got the king to sign it. We're going to take a look at some of these things later. But, uh, Again, same topic. What about chapter 4 and chapter 5? Chapter 4, the fall of Nebuchadnezzar, the fall of a king. Chapter 5, fall of a king, kingdom, if you want. Okay, so here they are. Prophecy about the rise and fall of kingdoms, Daniel 2 and 7. Persecution of God's people, Daniel 3 and Daniel 6. Daniel 4 and Daniel 5, prophecy about the fall of a king. And in, in Daniel chapter 4, he came back. And we're going to start. Uh, but anyhow, so of course, there are some differences, but there are also similarities. And here's the main thing, the main topics. So we have Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, that is, you know, the same sequence of the rise and the fall of nations, even the same. The same sequence, covering the same kingdoms, with a little bit different details. Quite amazing, isn't it? I mean, this is, uh, and it seems here, what could be the center point here, in this chiasm? This is a big one, and maybe a little bit harder to see. Um... I don't know exactly, but this shows the unity of the book of Daniel, and also... I think uh, what is also interesting, all of these chapters are written in Aramaic. Because the book of Daniel is written in Hebrew and Aramaic. So these are the Aramaic chapters. Hello there. <laughs> uh, okay, so this shows me at least that God is in control of history through all this. Through all this. God is in control of kingdoms and kings. That's one thought. But I don't know exactly. Um, there could be more things. Okay. We have also chiasm in the book of Revelation. Uh, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. But uh, you have kind of the introduction. The, the prologue. In the beginning. The testimony of Jesus. In the end. Reads about Jesus. I, Jesus, and the testimony. In the beginning, blessed are he who reads. 
in the end, blessed is he who keeps. Behold, he is coming. Behold, I am coming soon. I am the Alpha and the Omega. And the same in the end there. And then it gets to the next level. Christ walks among seven lamps. And then Christ is the eternal lamp, the tree of life, an open door or gates that never close, closes. Christ sits on his Father's throne, the throne of God and of the Lamb. The new Jerusalem is coming down on heaven. And then I'm coming soon. And then you have next level. Heaven is open. A rider on white and colored horses. And something similar there later in Revelation 19. Uh, Revelation 6 again. I have a judgment. In the end also, someone who judges. A white robes, kings. And then in Revelation 8 and Revelation uh, to 11 and Revelation 15 to 16. Talking about the earth, the sea, rivers and fountains, sun, moon, stars and so on. So you see, this is also a big chiasm in this whole book. And uh, it also comes down to the great controversy, more towards the middle. There's one exception. Let's see if I have it here. As you can see, the sequence is, uh, well, as far as here, it's fine. But here, these have switched places, if you are supposed to be exactly chronological. So, but it, at least it seems to be a, a, a kind of chiasm here. Okay, any questions on what we have covered so far? Please, please don't hesitate to ask if something you didn't get or it wasn't clear enough. Any questions from, from Kenya? No. Uh, no questions. Okay. You have a question, okay? Can you apply this uh, principle for all texts? The, the chiasm? Yeah. Yes, you, you can see that. Uh, and it's not exactly everywhere in the Bible. I know in Psalms you have a lot of it. But yes, you can find it through the Bible. So it can be good to keep in mind when you're studying, you know, to say, okay, is there... Could it be a chiasm here? Because sometimes when you read, you see this. Oh, they're repeating themselves, right? So it could be that there is a chiasm right there. Okay. Uh, well, I think you will just take... Uh, do you want to take a, a stretch again, a break, a short break, and get some air? Uh, and next uh, topic, like I said, would be about... Uh, look at uh, God's pattern in raising up prophets regarding time prophecies. So uh, I guess it fits good to take a break now, and then, then I cover this. And... In the end, I have also what is left after that is taking a look at the day-year principle. So I think we'll take a break, and then we have the last class after.